So back in 1929 in Hangzhou, China, there was this awesome competition that happened where all the masters decided to see who is the best. Let's find out. Ladies and gentlemen, hello, welcome back to the channel. My name's Matt, and if you're new here, this is a channel about Chinese martial arts. First and foremost, before we start, I've switched around my lighting. What do you think? For those who are new here, this is my lighting. What do you think? Okay, right, so let's talk about this week's topic. We're gonna to talk about this competition that happened back in Hangzhou, China. So anyone who's seen some of my other videos, I spoke about David Ross's book, Chinese Martial Arts, a historical outline. And in there, I found out about this, this competition from, first there was one in Nanjing in 1928, 1928. Uh, and this, and then the following year, back in 1929, there was another one in Hangzhou. And so just wanted to find out a bit more information about that. And so I was just doing the old Googles and found this old WordPress site. So there's no sources listed in this site. So my apologies, but um, I will link the site down below so you can actually go and read this article for yourself. So before we dive in, just a little recap for those of you who haven't had a chance to watch one of my videos on David Ross's book. We spoke about the nationalist government using Chinese martial arts as a way to sort of have this idea of the, the uh, China needs to become strong on the world stage and a metaphor for that is trying to get fit in Chinese martial arts. Sort of, it's far more complicated than that, but um, watch that video to find out more. I'll link it up here. So <laughs> let's jump into this competition, find out what happened. So a recap from 1928 as well. So the competition in Nanjing, it was so bloody and brutal that they kind of called it off at the end where they said, we'll just vote for the winner, opposed to, having more rounds of people getting injured. 1929, they didn't do that. They stuck with it till there was a, a final conclusion and there were actual winners for the competition. So let's have a look at what happened. Firstly, it was done on a lay tie. So for anyone who doesn't know Chinese martial arts, lay tie is just a, a raised platform. So unlike a boxing ring where there's ropes around the outside or the cage, if you've got sort of MMA stuff, a lay tie is just a raised platform, but you can push people off the edge, which is what happens in, um, in Sandar. You, you get extra points for getting someone out of the, the ring, basically off the mat. So this one was, let me get the, the measurements. So this one was four feet tall, 56 feet long and 60 feet wide, built specifically for the event. So it's quite big. I mean, it's, it's a sizable arena. First of all, at the beginning of the competition, there were forms, lots of people entered, hundreds of people entered, and firstly, there's a forms competition. Good old Chinese martial arts. Where would we be without forms? But eventually, we got to the point where um, everybody got together to, to test their, their martial arts against each other, and that's where it starts to get really interesting. Oh, and by the way, something that's also interesting when you read this article is it says that the audience was in tens of thousands of people. So it wasn't like a few people at the side of the road having a bit of a scrap. It must have been a huge event, and it's from from this article, it also says that you know, you've got Americans, Japanese, Russians there. So it was, must have been an absolute spectacle. And presumably with the support of the government, it would have, you know, that maybe would have amped it up even more, I don't know. But uh, sounds like it would have been incredible. And so the rules essentially, no attacking the eyes, throat or groin. Thereafter, it was a free for all as to what happened. And you can imagine, no gloves, people having a big scrap, lots of people got injured again. It's the inevitable result of people having fights without, um, without a significant amount of rules. But you can imagine for those people that say Kung Fu uh, they can only work in a street fight, all, the, all this ridiculous kind of stuff. This is where it was put to the test. So the rules were no attacking the eyes, throat or groin. And there was also an error in the rule. So day one, everybody starts fighting. Try and uh, find out who's gonna be the victor. This event goes on for days and days. But there was an error in the rules that anybody who, any match rather, where there was a draw, both contestants go through to the next round. So of course, everybody's holding back, trying to get a draw so they can go through to the next round and so, so forth. So by day two, they realized they had too many entrants still in the competition. And so because of that, they said that anybody who uh, was found to draw their match, both of them would be out. And because of that, people stopped holding back. And that's where oh, <laughs> all these extra injuries happened because of those. And so because of all these extra injuries that are happening from, from day two onwards, the judges then stipulated that there were no continuous attacks to the head. So if anybody knows exactly how that was, um, was administered or, or uh, reft, let me know in the comments below, because I can't imagine how many hits to the head is a continuous amount of hits. Is it just the one? Is it a jab punch? 
who knows? But because of that, what's interesting in this article, again, I, there was no sources here, so this is, this is just part of my journey to find out more information about these things. So if you're interested, obviously do me a favor, hit, hit subscribe and I'll do some more videos about this in the future. But um, it said that after the, it was prohibited to continuously attack the head, the skill level ro rose substantially, which is quite an interesting idea, isn't it? Are you skilled in that when people don't attack you to the head, you can do better or I don't know. It, it raises some questions though, doesn't it? Right, so anyway, that's something else that's interesting in this article. Um, again, I'll link it down below, so I, I don't want to take any credit from the author, but I'm just going to read one of the quotes from here because it's, um, it's interesting. I find these things fascinating. He says, no foreigners dared to enter the contest. Those orthodox inheritors of traditional martial arts, regardless of whether they were lofty monks or local grandmasters, were either knocked out or scared out of the competition. Hmm, very interesting, isn't it? Uh, and it says that everybody um, identified themselves as belonging to a traditional style, but they had secret auxiliary combat training. What does that mean? So again, this is all part of my thing to, uh, to go and find out some more. I know from David Ross's book, there's a suggestion that lots of people um, also train in Western boxing as well. So maybe that's what that means. Oh, something else that I, I should say in this competition, it says there are no weight categories. So for all the talk of internal martial arts and all these incredible powers you can get, we're down to physics again, aren't we? Where <laughs> If you've got no weight categories, if you're the small guy and you've got a big guy, well, maybe not sitting on top of you, but throwing punches at you, it's going to massively change the, the dynamic in that fight because you simply haven't got enough mass behind your strikes, regardless of the, the level of your, your skill. So that's quite an interesting twist as to all of these uh, fights. It's a complete free-for-all. This article also mentions that Contestants wore sort of like a shui jiao, like a Chinese wrestling style jacket, which if anyone who's, who's done anything where you can grip clothing, totally, totally changes the dynamic opposed to simply, you know, striking and trying to get your overhooks and your underhooks. Once someone can grip hold of your clothing and essentially not let go, that, that adds a whole twist as to the techniques you can use, your techniques as to whether they're effective. You know, if you're trying to evade people, but they've got hold of you, it makes things quite difficult. So, it just would have been fascinating. I just, I find this. The, the more I read about this competition, the more I want to find out more information about it. I will, I'm going to do lots of videos about, you know, these book reviews. I've done loads of playlists up here. Um, the book reviews have done loads of them finding more about the Chinese history. There's a whole book on Shaolin I'm going to read. But this, these competitions, these uh, tournaments sound absolutely fascinating. There's another part of this story which is quite interesting. So we've got a fight between Cao Yan, Cao Yan Hai and Liu Gaoshan. Don't know tones, don't know the characters, my apologies. Uh, but Cao Yan Hai and Liu Gaoshan had this fight and we've got Liu Gaoshan is a uh, Zhenrem, uh, uh, iron palm practitioner and uh, famed for his fighting ability. Cao Yanhai is not, <laughs> but he had more experience in actual fighting. His practice was just free sparring. And so whilst uh, Liu Gaosheng could have defeated him with his iron palm, and he did strike him once, which made uh, Cao Yanhai massively more evasive in the fight. His practice of doing free sparring, eventually he won. So he changed his, uh, he changed his approach from the second round onwards because he got this one incredible iron palm strike. And his skill in being able to fight different people, change his tactics, meant that he eventually won that fight opposed to this famous iron palm master who did strike him once but was then therefore unable to adapt his tactics after only having this incredible one strike. It's really interesting. It's all the stuff we know, but it's something that for Chinese martial artists, I think it's, we can get bogged down in tradition and forever doing form as opposed to applying it, which is something we'll, we'll talk about more in this channel, I'm sure. But uh, it's, it's fascinating, even back then, there's all the stories that people are almost learning today, again, as to seeing these fights in China with MMA uh, against masters who are 
not faring so well. So it's just fascinating to see this happened, you know, a hundred years ago. And some people haven't learned their lesson. And then later on in the article, it goes on to discuss some more fights, one of which talks about the one fighter using brute force and one fighter using cunning and how, how the two played out against each other. Okay, so the winners of the competition were Wang Ziqing, skilled at Shaolin and Shui Jiao, number one, two, uh, Zhu Guolu, Xing Yin Boxing, Zhang Dianqing, third, uh, Fan Zichuan, Shui Jiao, and Yi Chuan, Cai Yang Hai, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, check out the article. It's got a full list of, of the uh, top 15 winners in, in the competition. So the more I read on this competition and the history of Chinese martial arts, I feel like we sign up for class number one and you just need to get given a pamphlet with a reading list and all this stuff to find out. It's it's so cool that Chinese martial arts, which you know, people have this idea that it's happened hundreds of years ago and it's passed down perfectly to today. It's not the case, it's forever changing. And even something like these competitions, people are sure are stealing techniques or, or learning how to adapt their style. And ultimately that's, that's how these things progress. Chinese martial arts never finished, it never stopped and then it got handed down. It's just, humans learning stuff, telling other humans about it. And so the journey continues. And so the article is another window into this tournament that happened that I'm just gonna find out more and more information on just to see what happened. All my arts are from Fujian, so I'm interested to see uh, any stories about uh, masters from Fujian that went there. I certainly know Martin Watt's book mentions that some of the, the Yongchun White Crane masters go there as well, but they, they go north for a competition. I'm assuming it's the same one, but um, we'll find out. We'll find out. I don't know if anybody actually actually fought or engaged in, in some of the, the fights opposed to simply, simply doing forms. But I'll find out more about that. Hit subscribe if you want to find out more. Hit like to let the algorithm know that this is the kind of thing you enjoy. And here's a video. Uh, David Ross, it's the book that I mentioned, Chinese Martial Arts Historical Outline. I've done a couple of videos on it, but it's really worth, uh, worth a watch. The book's fantastic. I'll see you in the next video.